Thank you very much for uh, this uh, very kind invitation. And uh, I really enjoyed the talk throughout uh, these two days. Uh, and I certainly have learned a lot from uh, all this, the talks. Um, my task was talking about autonomic control of atrial arrhythmia. In response to a question of uh, this morning by an audience, the atrial arrhythmia, just like ventricular arrhythmia, does occur in a circadian pattern. This is a spontaneous symptomatic atrial fibrillation that was done in Israel. Uh, it was published in 1999. And for the past few years, we've been trying to record sympathetic nerve activity and correlate that with the onset of atrial arrhythmias. Uh, the method we use uh, is to directly use a commercially available transmitter and put the wires on top of the left stellar ganglion, and uh, then we induce atrial fibrillation. And uh, not induce, we create an animal model in which the animal will spontaneously develop atrial fibrillation. Uh, so what is the frequency content? of the signals from the left, left static angle. This is uh, of critical importance, of course. Uh, depends on what you want to record, uh, then uh, the other kind of no, uh, uh, signal became noise. So as uh, Dr. Joyner uh, this morning has said uh, very nicely, that uh, when, he, when the uh, microneurography micro was initially discovered, people thought it was noise that they couldn't get rid of. Uh, but the electrical signals in the static ganglion as well as on the surface of the body include the electrocardiographic signal and American heart standard is 0.5 to 150 bandpass filtering where it will give you the best electrocardiogram. Muscle, however, is up to 400 hertz, but the majority of them is going to be around 100 or less than 100 hertz. And the nerve activity goes throughout and go probably out to over 100 hertz. And typically, microneurography study uh, will filter at a very high uh, pass. Uh, it's a 700 high pass is one of the ways that people do filter. You can see you will have very little amount of signal left, but you are pretty sure those are nerves. Uh, if you can move that down, you, then you, you got much more signal content. The, uh, Device we have available to us is a DSI device, has a signal up to about the 200, 250 hertz. And uh, we uh, decided if we filter at 100, 150, we'll get rid of most of the ECGs and we can see this signal. For a short period of time, we do have two different kinds of device available. One kind is wide bandwidth signal, uh, just like this one, with a bandwidth about 200, uh, two, two kilohertz, and the sampling rate is about five. And in those uh, signal uh, recorded by the channel one, it's going to have much richer signal content than that you receive by the uh, less uh, sophisticated recording machine. That was a recording device that's uh, uh, built specifically to record the electrocardiogram. But both of them can uh, uh, pretty much detect onset of sinus tachycardia. However, if you blow up the signal 10 times, and only the first device will give you the sympathetic nerve activity that triggers this shortening of the R interval. And uh, this, uh, this device completely was enabled to make that recording. So this just shows an example of how the filtering of the signal, as well as the frequency content of the signal, make a significant difference. And we'll come back to discuss that for the majority of my talk. We did discover that in dogs with spontaneous onset of atrial arrhythmias, such as paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, simultaneous discharges from the static ganglion and the vagal nerve seems to be the triggering factor of the PAF. And the simultaneous discharge of static ganglion and vagal nerve activity seems to be converting the atrial uh, tachycardia into atrial fibrillation. Intrinsic cardiac nerve activity as uh, uh, the field was pre uh, pioneered by Dr. Armour, uh, and uh, many others have uh, seen a uh, uh, increasing importance uh, in uh, if we look at uh, the signal carefully. And this is one example in which we show that the uh, intrinsic nerves, uh, ligament martial nerve activity, select ganglion nerve activity, actually precedes, uh, uh, the superior left GP nerve activity actually precedes the external nerve activity, and that was associated with atrial tachycardia. 
the uh, ablation of the ganglion plexite or uh, steroid ganglion as shown in here will reduce uh, peroxidant atrial fibrillation episodes and uh, more difficult for the AF to sustain. So that was uh, what we have published already. But there is uh, a uh, somewhat a frustration. It's, this is going to be very difficult to translate to our patients or to patient care, in part because it's so difficult to get to record the nerve activity. That Dr. Joyner, again, this morning has very nicely showed a standard technique of doing nerve activity, but he also said that uh, in order to do microneurography, people has to be at rest. Uh, however, uh, the surface of the skin could be a window to the heart, and uh, maybe it's also a window to the nerve. The reason I'm saying that is uh, uh, there are a lot of people all agree, I think, uh, we all know that the skin uh, is very well innervated by sympathetic nerves, and part of the reason is that it is required for blood, uh, blood vessel control. So during sympathetic drive, you would have blood vessel constriction, dilatation, and you would uh, have uh, uh, sweating, and so forth. Those are all a part of the fight and flight response. So there are plenty of nerves under the skin. And just like uh, a, uh, uh, microelectro wires, the skin actually is a conductor. So it is at all possible that we can record from the surface of the skin the activity of the sympathetic nerve activity. And that is the hypothesis we've been working on. And number two is that uh, where does the skin sympathetic nerve, active, uh, nerve came from? If you do uh, nerve tracer studies and inject the tracers in the neck and upper portion of the thorax, the tracer would go back into the stellar ganglion and mid middle cervical ganglion. If you inject the lower part, such as in the leg, uh, as people do in microneurography studies, those ganglion actually con uh, nerves actually connect with the rest of the sympathetic nervous system indirectly. It doesn't go to the stellar ganglion. So it seems to me that if you were to think that, that there is certain organization of the sympathetic nervous system and you want a way to detect the stellar ganglion nerve activity, then uh, the best to do is probably, you probably have the best luck to record from upper body then record from the lower body, such as the microneurography study. I was trying to ask Dr. Joanna this morning, but my question did not go in. I do know that people have done uh, subcutaneous nerve and the muscle sympathetic nerve recording from the upper body, but I don't know how it correlates with the one recorded from the standard uh, peroneal nerve. So we look back into our data. We do have a uh, recording that uh, has on the static ganglion, but in order to maximize recording the ECG, we have implanted two electrodes on the chest. And uh, from the very beginning, that was about 2005, roughly 10 years ago, we see noise. And the noise on the ECG is something we can't get rid of, uh, even with 150 high-pass filter. It's just very high-frequency noise over here. And that seems to correlate with static ganglion nerve activity. And one day just down to us, that it is possible these are nerve activities. So how about we filter not just the static ganglion or vagal channel, how about we filter the ECG channel? So we filter the ECG channel and it became this. This we abbreviated as SCNA or subcutaneous nerve activity as compared with standard abbreviation SSCNA, uh, SSNA, or sub, which encodes the same thing, but usually is used by microneurographer to indicate it's a, uh, subcutaneous nerve activity recorded by microelectrode. And uh, to our surprise, we saw that SCNA matches very well as, with SGNA, but they are not exactly the same. So here's SGNA, the SCNA is shorter, SGNA is longer. This is probably not uh, crosstalk because it certainly looks a different duration. But when they fire, there is elevation of a heart rate. Here's another example. Uh, in this particular one, Actually, SCNA activated uh, earlier than SGNA, and if you look at the heart rate acceleration, actually, it is after the onset subcutaneous nerve activity, but slightly before the onset stellar ganglion nerve activity. Again, the morphology of these two are completely different, but they are roughly uh, the same. 
And if you do integrate nerve activity, each point uh, is one minute of a nerve activity that integrate together. You will see there is a pretty good correlation between the static ganglion nerve activity and subcutaneous nerve activity recorded from the chest with R value of 0.78. And the uh, correlation with the heart rate is also pretty good. Actually, if anything is better, heart rate correlate better with subcutaneous nerve activity then correlate with left static ganglion nerve activity. We have been doing video imaging. This is our obsession about whether or not this is just, we are just recording noise. And this is a dog, uh, exceptional uh, condition. The dog was standing and the dog was uh, something attracted uh, uh, his attention, moved the neck to the left. And you see the static ganglion continue to fire, but to a lesser extent, subcutaneous nerve activity fires massively. That was a, happened to be associated with most of the heart rate acceleration. We then uh, looked back into our old data back in 2008, where Shin Mei has published this particular study showing we have a certain cardiac death model. And uh, she has discovered that the left stellar ganglion nerve activity, uh, we call it uh, when it fires in low amplitude, burst discharge activity pattern, here's the integrated nerve activity. And that occurs before the onset of the VT. And we still have that set of data. So we went back, and one of uh, the cardiology fellow, Dr. Dovichnova, just published this. Uh, actually, uh, it's been printed uh, this month. Uh, the uh, subcutaneous nerve activity, uh, as in the normal dogs, does track with static ganglion nerve activity. And they both precede the onset of ventricular tachycardia. And sometimes it's very difficult to filter the uh, subcutaneous nerve activity out of the uh, filtered ECG out of the signal, but you can still see there's high frequency signal in the subcutaneous tissue that does precede the onset of ventricular tachycardia. Here's another example where I just have time to show over here subcutaneous nerve activity, uh, hyperactive and the induced ventricular fibrillation as magnified below there. During the uh, nerve activity, there is PVC, long short coupling, and results in ventricular fibrillation. And after ventricular fibrillation, the subcutaneous nerve activity was quiescent for a short period of time. Oh, you don't see my arrow, what I'm doing. I was doing my arrow pre, uh, yeah, and there's no, no light either. Uh, so, okay, there is a, uh, yeah, there is a light over here. Yeah, so there's quiescence. And uh, after the dog has cardiopulmonary arrest, there is a rapid, vast, massive burst of sympathetic discharge. The same thing occurs in the stellar ganglion. If you look carefully, uh, in two of dogs, we have this recording. This massive discharge actually was coincidental with VT to VF transition. Uh, here's another uh, episode in which the stellar ganglion nerve activity in the subcutaneous nerve induced ventricular tachycardia, uh, tachycardia and uh, accelerated idioventricular rhythm. And uh, here is uh, an example, it causes uh, frequent bijamian uh, rhythm. And uh, uh, there was the activity of stellar ganglion and subcutaneous nerve activity that causes PVC or associated with the PVC. If we integrate this nerve activity and look back before the onset of uh, the subcutaneous nerve activity, we saw that uh, there is a crescendo increase over the 62nd period prior to the onset of VT, suggesting that they are somehow related. Uh, we then pro uh, progress to a record from the skin. So we thought that if the skin is a conductor, there's no reason why we can't record it this on the surface of the skin. And we record it in the standard ECG lead one, standard ECG lead two, bipolar right and bipolar left, separated by 12 centimeter. But we, in another study, we uh, did uh, separate only by four centimeter. We injected, Apamine, which is uh, SK channel blocker and the neurotoxin, will massively activate right stellar ganglion and also activate simultaneously the skin sympathetic nerve activity. And the, the timing over here is so fast, it's probably not because the neurotoxin has been absorbed and circulated to the skin and causing this activity. And you can see the re uh, correlation between the integrated right uh, stellar ganglion nerve activity and integrated skin sympathetic nerve activity was not bad. And there are also pretty good indication uh, relationship with heart rate. 
And this is on the surface of the dog's skin. The dog is conscious, was gently held by uh, the fellow, and uh, this is in, in her, uh, recorded through a neurotransmitter, implanted neurotransmitter. This is what is recorded on the skin, ECG1, 2, R, and L configuration. You can see when there is a massive discharge from steroid ganglion associated with discharge on the skin, there is a large acceleration of heart rate, and the correlation was very good. And if you tabulate the correlation among various uh, integrated uh, ganglion, uh, steroid ganglion nerve activity, skin nerve activity, and always heart rate, uh, the R value averages roughly are 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.5. It's not perfect, but there is a pretty good correlation between what is measured on the surface of the skin and what is measured directly on the steroid ganglion. And coming back to my topic, we've been recently been looking at the activity of subcutaneous nerve activity and onset of uh, atrial tachyarrhythmia in this uh, particular case is uh, uh, local bipolar electrogram looks like it is atrial tachycardia. And you can see there's a massive, uh, quick onset of uh, tachycardia after the steroid ganglion nerve activity and the subcutaneous nerve activity. So there was a question about the most commonly used non-invasive method, that is the heart rate variability. And we have measured against uh, subcutaneous nerve activity before and after myocardial infarction, showing increased uh, subcutaneous nerve activity as expected. That goes along with SGNA. Uh, but other heart rate variability parameters, SDNN, does have a circadian variation before and after MI, but the changes before and after myocardial infarction is small. There are several other parameters we did, and we did see a circadian variation of those parameters, but after uh, myocardial infarction induced changes is much smaller than what we can see with skin sympathetic nerve activity. This paper was just posted online. And finally, just as a preliminary results, we have uh, done this in human patients. This is a patient uh, with uh, 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 no known heart diseases, and the patient was admitted to a video monitoring unit for epilepsy uh, study. And uh, this is a channel two. You can see there is uh, some ECG noise uh, because we do high frequency, high power band bandwidth recording. You can see the elevation of the heart rate and shortening of the QT interval in this patient. And we will have more data to show uh, during the heart uh, meeting this year. So in conclusion, steroid ganglion nerve activity is a direct trigger of atrial arrhythmia. Skin nerve activity, as well as subcutaneous nerve activity recorded using subcutaneous surface ECG electrodes can be used to estimate SGNA. And this new set method, which we call it new ECG, may be helpful in studying sympathetic tone in humans. Thank you.